If you'll open your Bibles tonight to Isaiah 58, that, this passage will be the, um, the basis for everything I'm going to talk about, though we'll go to uh, a variety of other uh, scriptures tonight. It's interesting that in the setting of Isaiah, you have chapter 58, which is the uh, passage on fasting, and in chapter 59, you have... Uh, you have intercession. You have two extended passages on subjects that throughout the scripture are connected as, as if they were companion. So that when you have fasting, you generally, if, you're, if you look at the context and the setting, you'll generally have people in prayer seeking the Lord. So you have intercession. You don't always, when you, when you read about intercession, you don't always have the fasting accompanying that. But the other, the other side is, is, is pretty well true in the, in the pattern in the scripture. So I'm going to deal with, in the next 40 minutes uh, or so, I'm going to deal with the idea of fasting, the whole idea of intercession and prayer. Uh, none of the things I'm going to talk about are, uh, are to displace, replace, uh, move past uh, in any way, the, uh, the power of the church at prayer or of you personally at prayer. And uh, so just because I don't address it, uh, you'll understand why there just isn't enough time to address both of these subjects tonight. So let me just, uh, let me first uh, call your attention to this handout that is uh, on your chair tonight. This will uh, serve as a practical guide to these 21 days that are yet before us. And uh, before I get into the, the, the biblical teaching on fasting, let me just say that the Bible has uh, a number of approaches to fasting. And in the scripture, you'll, you will see a number of fasts with a certain duration of time. Uh, I'm not here tonight to address how long someone should fast or uh, you know, that's pretty much up to you. We're calling the church to a 21-day fast. Uh, you, should, uh, you should fast however you feel led of the Lord. If you have serious health issues uh, and you need to eat, there are other ways uh, to fast. For those of you who go, wow, that's my out. I know, I'm, I, know I hadn't been feeling well the last few days, and, and uh, then you don't get an out. I'm sorry, but, you, but you're still in there. Um, but there, there are ways to abstain from that. In the, I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is happening in the children's ministry. I just didn't get a chance to ask Rochelle, but uh, we have in the past, even in children's ministry, they have paralleled the church, not in the kids fasting from food, but fasting from other things, where it might be some television or, or um, you know, atrocious things like candy or, you know, whatever. But the point is that that there is some kind of, uh, of the kids learning this discipline uh, as we come before the Lord. So um, the 21-day the, the fast is actually taken from the book of Daniel, um, chapter 10. I'll get there tonight. In fact, we'll close with that uh, passage. There are other uh, fasts in the scripture for various lengths of the time. Uh, I think, I think Becky and I mentioned one time that we, we called the church to a 40-day fast, and uh, we didn't ask everyone to fast full for 40 days, uh, but uh, Becky and I decided that we would only, um, uh, we would not, we, we would fast by, with li just liquids for 40 days, so Becky's story is that um, about halfway through uh, uh, the rumor through the church was that I was on chemo and, and might die because I looked so gaunt. <laughs> Becky said nobody accused her of anything remotely like that. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so you, you take whatever, you approach this however you want. Maybe that's a meal a day. Maybe it is a certain day of the week or two that you pick to fast in a full uh, fast for that period of time. Uh, but the, the issue is that what we want to see is the spirit in the congregation of all of us setting ourselves to seek the Lord because of the day. Uh, it's not just the beginning of a new year and it's something we should do. 
But hopefully, by, uh, when I get done tonight, the instruction in the scripture, there will be enough here that will uh, say to us, we should be in light of the day. And so I, I'm, I will address this from, um, a, from a, a corporate setting, the day around us, uh, the nation that we live in, uh, the evil of the day, things that we see like that, things that won't break loose. Uh, but every one of these has personal application in things that you may face in your own uh, spiritual journey, in your own lives right now. So uh, if you have questions on exactly, you know, is this a good idea to do this or do that? Any of us on the pastoral team, we're glad to uh, address this. We certainly don't know it all. We're not here up here trying to do that, uh, but we'll, we'll be glad to give you our opinion at the end of the day. Uh, how you go about this is up to you. And I, uh, in just about every fast I've ever called the church to, um, uh, we have taken that approach, that we're not trying to be rigid, legalistic in the approach here, but with the same heart that we approach this because we have some understanding of, uh, of the day around us and of why, uh, how we approach this day in, in, uh, in fasting. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6 will say, uh, and the Lord speaking, is this not the fast that I have chosen? It's interesting that God clearly says that there are fasts that he wills. Fast that he intends to be observed with spiritual understanding. So that you move into a fast as, a, uh, as if you were responding to a summons, a call. You, you are responding with obedience so that you are not observing this as some, as the Pharisees did. They fasted to be seen of men. We're not doing, we're not doing this for that reason. We're doing it because we have, uh, again, we have some understanding of the reasons uh, to walk this way. As fasting purges the physical body of impurities, it also purifies the spiritual man, rooting out what has been tolerated that is in opposition to the way of the Lord. In other words, it, it, when I get to the end tonight and I'm gonna deal with, um, uh, with some examples of the scripture that you wade into because uh, you know fasting is a discipline. You're not earning anything when you fast. You're simply walking in what God said he would make powerful if you would do that. And the choice of obedience is yours. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but when you do fast, what takes place, because in the fasting you're seeking the Lord. And when we get to the end tonight and I pray, and I'm gonna ask you if you have some specific things that are relative to you and the situation that you face right now, things that you will, uh, you will put in front of you as you walk through these days. Uh, one of the things that will take place uh, in addition to that is that as you, as you discipline yourself to seek the Lord in fasting and prayer, God will deal with you. Uh, you know, you go in for, you're going to have a test for whatever, and the doctor tells you, now, you know, you, I want you to fast. You know, you could go without eating for a day or so. You get busy, it doesn't even bother you. But when that doctor says, you can't eat anything after midnight, you're normally not even up at midnight. You wouldn't even know. But at midnight, you are absolutely so hungry, you can't stand it, and you're positive by 6 a.m. you're going to die before that 10.30 test. It's amazing, isn't it? But so as you walk this way, uh, uh, there's a purifying work of the Spirit as God deals with you. Let me give you, uh, let me just give you some, some examples in the word of, um, of uh, fasting. Uh, first, it is by the direct teaching of, uh, of Jesus himself. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Um, Matthew 6, 16. 
Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Mark 2.20. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And then you have the example of the early church. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Chapter 14, verse 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. 1 Corinthians 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, verse 5, verse, chapter 6, verse 5, and chapter 11, verse 27. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, Paul is saying, in fastings, in fastings. So fasting is not a mystical, ascetic exercise of piety. It is a powerful particip participation point in seeing the release of God's purposes. Uh, notice here in Isaiah chapter 58, the practical and visible results that come from the practice of fasting. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a lot of this really quick. And uh, because I, there are some things at the end that I want to focus on. But you can go back. You can either re-watch this or you can, you can jot down the verses fast enough. You go back and uh, take a, a more in-depth look at some of this that I'm giving you. Look at verses 7 through 12. Uh, verse 7, food made available to the needy. The, these are the things that come out of people who fast. There are certain things that they're not necessarily fasting for this but it is how the response of a person who is actually drawn nearer to God uh, in the purifying work of the Spirit. Um, uh, there is a genuine service and concern for those who are without. Uh, the last part of verse 7, verse 8, there's life and health-giving ministry that begins to flow from you. Verse 9, personal answers to prayer begin to be released. The last part of verse 9, a removal of the spirit of criticism uh, graces your own life. Verse 11, there's God-directed and fruitful living that comes out of that. And verse 12, an edifying, uniting life follows. Uh, so when we, when we talk about what does fasting do in these verses you see the answer. It accomplishes something that allows for liberty from spiritual bondage and oppression. Look at verse 6 that's there. Um, and let me just read this. In Mark chapter 9, verse 29, uh, Jesus is teaching there. And uh, so I'm just going to read this from a commentator. Concerning the authority of the words and fasting, significant is the note from Dr. Morrison quoted in the, in the expositor's Greek Testament, volume one, page 404. The authorization for omitting and fasting because of absence in some ancient manuscripts is not sufficient. But even if it were overwhelmingly, fasting would in its essence be implied. Talking about this particular uh, portion of the scripture. If you look at verse uh, six in chapter 58, notice what verse six says. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. And I want you to see uh, the parallel between this here in the book of Isaiah and the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus real. So here in Isaiah 58, you have, uh, this is what comes out of the fast, that God wills. If you look at Luke chapter uh, 4, verse 18, this is what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The idea there 
I, I want you to just see the parallel between the spiritual fast and uh, the ministry of the Spirit through Jesus that actually is the ministry that he bequeaths to all of us, uh, uh, to his church. In uh, verse 12 of Isaiah 58, there is here in this 12th verse, at least for me, there is a, a picture of what fasting addresses and the outcomes for those who would walk that way. And there are four, there are four aspects to this picture in, in this 12th verse. Those from among you shall build the old waste places you shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Again, uh, a picture, you know, earlier in the chapter, we have everything that is, that is specifically addressed here to fasting. Verse 12, then in, in this verse, it seems to me there is a picture of what fasting addresses and what the outcomes are for, are for those who will walk this way. Now, again, uh, what's mentioned here, there is a parallel, even to verse 6, to some of the other things that you see, you'll see them in just a bit of a different light. Let me address these in verse 12. Uh, first, uh, there is the building of the old waste places. The picture there is uh, because of sin... Brokenness has come, and, um, and with the passing of time, the breaking becomes normal. It looks normal. It's not normal, but it looks normal. As sin always destroys. And so, so now what was once vibrant and full of life now uh, is a waste place. The beauty is gone. The, the, the picture, the sad picture here is of, of, of what you can learn to accommodate. Well, things that sometime before that you never would have. But you just learned to live with it. And now it becomes, it begins to define you. And so rather than the beauty of what once was or the beauty of intended purpose, there is a waste place. So verse 12 says, and this is coming, taking this in the context of the chapter, the outcome, you will build the old waste places. The question would be, what has wasted? What has become a waste place that needs to be recovered and restored. Second is raising up the foundation of many generations. Raising up the foundation of many generations. The, the, uh, the foundation to a building is largely unseen. But it's the most critical part of the building because if you, if you don't have a proper foundation at some point, the building uh, one corner will, you know, we live in a place where um, because of the soil that's here and all of the rain where the soil expands, it contracts, dries out, and the foundations begin to move. And you, you, you might live in a house that it looked great when you bought it. And then all of a sudden you put a level on the floor and there's part of the house that's, that's or you see, start to see cracks in the walls uh, of that house. Um, uh, the other thing that can happen with foundations is, uh, is that the structures that are built upon them uh, can be ruined or torn down, and the foundation can be covered over with debris. And if you hadn't passed that way before, you might just see what the overgrowth was and you would never know that there had once been a house there or that the foundation was even there. Um, and the idea here would be that uh, for things to be rebuilt that have been covered over, the foundations have to be uncovered. You have to get back 
down to the foundation that's there. The third picture is the, called the repairer of the breach. The breach is a hole. Uh, something has penetrated. You see the pictures of war, either out of Ukraine or um, the devastation that's happening in Gaza, uh, the response of Israel to the slaughter of, uh, of the innocent. And you see, you see the result of the weapons that have been used, and you can see a wall that has a hole blown in the wall. Uh, maybe, maybe that hole was because there was um, someone there, might not, you, you, if you take your picture away from the war that's happening, maybe it's a hole that's blown because someone wants what's beyond the wall and they're a usurper, an intruder. So a hole, they make a hole and now an outside force can get into that breach. That's the picture, incidentally, of the book of uh, Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, you know, goes back to rebuild the city because the walls, any, any old intruder could make their way into the city of Jerusalem. Though the temple had been restored, Zerubbabel had come back, and in basically two waves, the temple had been restored. Ezra comes to restore worship Nehemiah comes back because the walls, the, the gates are burned. There are no gates, so authority, authority is gone. And the gates, that which represented protection and boundaries, uh, those are broken. And the wall can be t penetrated by anyone. In fact, Sanballat and Tobiah who come in the book of Nehemiah to mock and make fun of the Jews that have come back to build, they say, what is that? Uh, 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 it's nothing. Someone could just kick it over. It's, it's, they, they mocked what it was of the rebuilding that was done. The repair of the breach where, is where there needs to be repairs that are made that the purpose of the wall might be realized. The idea here would be where are there breaches in the lives of people or family members or your own life? where there comes the penetration of hell's power and there needs to come that which plasters that over and, and closes that breach that's there. The repairer of the breach, the fourth one, is the restorer of streets to dwell in. Jerome renders this, turning your paths into rest. Um, when, a, uh, when a, a country was overrun, uh, many times uh, there were things that would be ruined. Much of that might be the, the roads, the, the means of travel. Uh, but even if you don't go there, if you just take, if you've ever been out in the country and there was a road, maybe it wasn't much of a road, but it was a, it was a it was an access and uh, to some place, but it hadn't been it hadn't been utilized in a very long time. And you could imagine this if you live here in this part of Texas. And you know, if you don't, uh, I, I think if you didn't really take care of uh, of a driveway or whatever here over time, uh, uh, what we call grass—that's really not grass at all—it would encroach, and you you wouldn't even you wouldn't even see it. It, it ultimately would overtake. It just keeps encroaching. And the, the, the picture here is of, uh, is of uh, brush, thorns, uh, trees, things that would, that, would, uh, that would grow and essentially cover the roadway, the access. And so because they were neglected for a long period of time, now what has been made what, what, it, what was intended to be the passageway, now it's impassable. You don't even know, or if you do know, when you, looked, when you look at what's there, uh, you couldn't get the vehicle down uh, that road. 
So what that does it is, is that it impedes the connection of one city to another. If you want to travel from where you are freely to another place, another location, but the road in between is overgrown and it's impassable, you can't get from where you are to where you need to be. You can't get there. So, so your passage in life is obstructed by this. And uh, uh, maybe in this picture you could see yourself as you are separated from home, in Jerome's words. And to get home, you have to travel through a place, but the road is gone. It's all this tangle and brush and everything that's there. And so something comes, something has to come that clears that out and makes it, the obstructions are cleared out and where travel, where, where travel has been hindered and impeded, now that's cleared out and you can, you can travel freely to the destination that you're going. Um, if, if it is the idea of returning home, home, that, that place of, when I go home, home is the place from where everything emanates. So hopes and uh, dreams and hopes and all of those kinds of things. So that what, what has obstructed your ability to get to where everything uh, comes from, now that's cleared out and you're able to go there. So verse 12 uh, again, just pictures those things that verse 6 states. Here is the fast that I have willed. Verse 12, in my, in my humble opinion, is just another picture of showing you what the fast that God wills. Here is what is accomplished when a person comes to walk this way. These are the kinds of things that take place. So let me wrap this up tonight with... Uh, with four examples of, from, the, from the scripture. When should a people fast? Now, I'm not addressing in this, um, I'm not addressing um, a, 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 a practice, a regular practice of people fasting. I'm not addressing that. What, what I'm gonna address in these four things are, are specific situations that you find yourself uh, confronting. The first one is in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, and it is at a time of transition in national government. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. Bible says, and they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. So what's happening right here contextually is that there's a changing government. So there's a new ruler coming, new rulership that's happening here. And um, uh, the, uh, certainly in, in the day that we live in, uh, not only are we praying for a transition in national government, but we should be praying we, because as we face this year, this is a decision time. The people of God, uh, you know, it's not about being Democrat or Republican. This is way bigger than that. This is about a, uh, a direction in our nation led by our leader that is taking this nation rapidly down the pathway of destruction. And uh, you, can, you can have whatever political view you want, but, but if you're a believer, what you are not allowed to have is a, is a political view that is in opposition to the way of the Lord. As a believer, you are not allowed to have that. So say, well, you know, 
uh, Steve, I just love Jesus and I vote for politicians that vote to kill babies. You are not allowed that. Shame on you. Well, I've just been this my whole life. I don't care what you've been your whole life. Now your life is not your own if you know Jesus. And it's not about you and it's not about your way. It is about his way. Did you get the point on that one? At a time of transition and national, do I need to go any further or y'all? If you got it, just say got it. All right, very good, I'll move on. I really wanna stay there, but I'll move on, okay. <laughs> Secondly, um, at a time of God's people face deadly satanic attack. We're living in that day. Esther chapter four, verse 16. If you don't know the story of Esther, you need to go home and read the Bible book of Esther. I don't have time to go into that, but it is a very fascinating story in the scripture um, of a people who faced extinction and of the deliverance of God through a woman who comes to the place of saying, if I perish, I perish. And she speaks to Mordecai, her uncle, and says, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So at a time when God's people face deadly satanic attack, you are, admitting, you are living right now in the middle of all hell breaking loose. The people of God in the nation right now should be responding in every way possible to fight this battle that we are in from a spiritual perspective. While we should vote, we should have good candidates run, we should do all of those kinds of things, not minimizing any of that because all of that is critically important as I mentioned on Sunday where we are occupying the temporal. That's what that would be. We're occupying the day. We're participating in those things. But there is a spiritual side that you cannot just win the temporal war. You must, do, take, you must uh, participate in the battle, in the spiritual battle that's taking place. And, it's the, and the church largely does not know how to fight those kinds of battles. We're, we, we, we tend to think that if we could just find some people that are more godly than we are, who know how to fight the battle, they, they could handle it. No, it's, it's really up to you and me. Will we in fact be the people of God in the middle of an evil day? And uh, when we see deadly satanic attack, will we stand in the middle of that? Above all, stand. Put on the weapons of your warfare. Um, and uh, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, Ephesians 6. Third, um, uh, the third uh, thing is uh, Ch Ezra chapter 8. At a time when a great project was being undertaken, it's... Um, so Zerubbabel, as I said earlier, Zerubbabel goes back. It was uh, uh, Artaxerxes allows a group of people to go back to rebuild uh, the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem. They've been destroyed. Um, they, they begin to rebuild. They get discouraged. They quit. So, uh, so God uh, uh, stirs them up through the prophet and tells them to get on with the work and get the temple rebuilt. They do that. Now Ezra goes back. Ezra will go back as the one who comes to restore worship and as a reformer. And um, uh, in chapter 8, verse 21, this is as he's preparing the group that will go with him. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our 
possessions. There was a great project that was being undertaken. Uh, you know, and the, and, the, and the project can be as it was, the, the, the whole project there was all of the restoring and the rebuilding of the city of God. Not just the temple, but getting the walls rebuilt. As I said, that the, the, walls, the walls represent wholeness, they represent, they represent protection, boundaries, all of those things that, that a city must have. The gates that are burned with fire, those gates represent authority. It was at the gates of the city that the elders of the city would come and do civic business. So the gates didn't just have to do with egress, but they, they did have to do with that. But they didn't just have to do with egress. They also had to do with authority and governance and power and those kinds of things. So when you, when you see the, read the book of Ezra, read the book of Nehemiah, and you're seeing, you're seeing the, the overall picture of this great project that's being undertaken. It's, uh, uh, you know, we have one of those right now, right here, for us. We've called it Cornerstone. But it has to do with providing for uh, the future of what God wants to do through Grace Woodlands. We could sit here in what we have here, be happy, be content. We could tell everybody about everything that God's doing and all of that, and all of that would be true. The question is, is this all that God wants to do? Or is there more? Well, we spoke, we all, we all prayed and sought, and sought the Lord, and earlier last year, we all made some commitments, some sacrificial commitments. And, the, and all those resources and funds have been coming in, and, uh, and you haven't heard an update from me because the first, the first thing out the get-go on the building was the cost was so exorbitant that we couldn't do it. So we've been back revisiting. We do think we've come up with a way that will reduce the cost by millions of dollars. But I want to be sure before I tell you. So don't tell anybody I said this. <laughs> Just keep a secret, all right? And, uh, but, but in the next few weeks, we're, we're going to know. We're going to have some, some, some costs. Uh, we've, we've been able to simplify things. It'll, it'll still be a great facility. It'll be great. In fact, probably better than what we had drawn before. But it's taken some time for us to go back, revisit this with all the architects, put all of our heads together, come up with those things. And, uh, uh, but we're in the middle of that, of a great project where we need the help of the Lord. We need the provision of God. We need him to speak to people. We need, uh, we need to be prepared for a day because if we're just building a big building to, big, to build a big building, we shouldn't do it. I wouldn't ask you to give your money to something like that just so we had some edifice sitting on this property. But the cause we have is great. What we are about, well, those of you that are, are my age or close, a cause that if Jesus doesn't come will far outlive us. For folks that are, as I said, my age or even 10 or 15 years younger than me or you're older than I am, like Becky, much older, <laughs> Uh, if you're in Becky's group, older, we're making an investment in other generations. They're really important. And uh, so the idea of when you have a great project, one of the examples of scripture is you face that with seeking the Lord and fasting. The last one, um, the last one, is uh, the book of Daniel. This is, if you've never read this in the book of Daniel, it is the most fascinating passage of scripture. I'm, I'm gonna call your attention to it briefly, but you need to go back and read this in detail. So I'm gonna, what I've done a whole teaching on, I'm gonna try to do in the next five minutes and, uh, and, and give you at least an overview of, of, uh, of this last one. Uh, the, the, the biblical example of fasting at a time prophetic promise was due to be activated, Daniel chapter 9. At a time when prophetic promise was due to be activated. Um, Daniel says, as he opens chapter 9, he said, I understood by the books the number of the years 
specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So here's the picture. Uh, Daniel is a part of the group that had been exiled. I, I, I've mentioned this before as common practice. When, a, when a, an, an invading power conquered a country or region, that they, they, if they, if, particularly if they were a world power, they didn't have a big enough army to control everything. So how they would keep control is they would take a group of the population from one place they conquered, and they would move it over to another country. And, uh, and then they would take a group from that country and move it to another country. So they would move these people around. Uh, generally, each of the group hated the other people. So what, what, what they would accomplish by this is that the vitriol, rather than being directed at the power that invaded them, would be directed at the people they lived with, each other. And, that, and they would keep control that way. So Daniel is part of the group that is carried away into captivity. But God had spoken. Uh, Israel was judged uh, because of their turning to idol worship. Their prophets repeatedly came to them, called them to repent, and they didn't. And so there came the day that Jerusalem was destroyed. What you, what you read about in the recovery of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, what you read about there uh, is that's the, that's the brokenness that came of the judgment of God. But God said, 70 years and I will restore prophetically. So when you come to Daniel, Daniel is one of those carried away into captivity. Daniel is, according to the scripture, he is reading the books and records. So he understands, he understands by the word that God had spoken these years. And here's what Daniel says. I, it was time. By what the Lord had spoken, it was time to see this take place, but I don't see it happening yet. I don't see the return. I don't see what God had said would, uh, would take place. Chapter 9. And uh, so then you go, you, you can read the rest of, of chapter 9 because here he will talk about uh, 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 confessing sin, getting your heart right, you know, when you, when you come to seek the Lord. And so here in chapter 9, you, you will see that uh, the preparation of the, of the human heart, the cleansing of the heart. And then you go to chapter 10. <clears throat> and so here's what the scripture says. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. So now when you get to chapter 10, now there is a vision. Now, now the spirit world comes into the scene in chapter 10. And <clears throat> Daniel has this message. And here's what he says. The message is true. Um, but, and there was an appointed time, but the appointed time isn't happening. And then it says Daniel has understanding of, of the vision. Verse 2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. That, when you see the word mourning there, that means fasting. It doesn't mean he was going around with a big old long face. Uh, this, this idea of the word mourning is translated would uh, many times throughout the Old Testament uh, is, is specifically fasting. Not just somebody that, that you know, is having a bad day. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, 21 days. 
I ate no pleasant food, no meat, nor wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. This is where you would get when people talk about the Daniel fast. It's a partial fast. So it's not like Daniel didn't eat anything, but there were things he did not eat uh, in this fast. Let me just read this. I know we're just a couple of minutes over, but... Um, now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl. You understand that he's speaking here of, an, of a heavenly being. His face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So, so the people around Daniel, they didn't see what was going on. Daniel saw this vision, but they knew something was happening. So much so that, well, in, in the words of the scripture, they went to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me for my vigor was turned uh, to frailty in me and I retained no strength. So Daniel's saying this heavenly uh, visitation that came, it, it reduced me. Doesn't mean he, he fell over and passed out. I don't know if he did that or not, but the bottom line is all of his strength, all of his strength is gone. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. And suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. I want you to get this picture. Here's a man, he has an understanding. The first understanding he has is just by the record. How many times uh, are there things that we face that confront us and there's something about it that we say, it, it should have happened. But we don't, see, we don't see it happening yet. Then he has a vision. So now... Whatever understanding he has is coming from this visitation of this uh, angel or this heavenly being. And uh, verse 12, then he said to me, do not fear Daniel. Notice this. This is important because here you are given as clear a picture into the realm of the spirit as exists in the word. So that when you are slugging it out in the middle of the discipline of setting your face to something that is resisting you and you wonder if the day will ever come when, when there comes spiritual breakthrough, this will give you insight to look beyond what is right there in front of you, confronting you and look into the spirit realm to recognize uh, let me say it this way, to recognize something that's happening there even though it is difficult to understand it completely. Notice what the scripture says. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, that was when Daniel set himself to fast. Your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. If you are discouraged, if you are facing something that won't seem to budge, that is bigger than you, and the enemy says to you, you should just give up, this will never, this will never change at all, I want to say to you tonight, heaven heard you on the very first time that you cried out in regard to that and what you cannot see with these eyes because everything in front of you looks like there is no breakthrough and nothing will ever happen. I want to encourage you tonight to look 
beyond these eyes and to see into the realm of the Spirit as to what is taking place there. I have come because of your words. Notice verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. How long was Daniel fasting? 21 days. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. So it's not that there wasn't a real prince of, of Persia, prince of the kingdom of Persia. But this phrase is just another descriptive phrase for hell, for the devil. That somehow, and, I, and again, I'm not up here to try to explain how this works. I don't know. You'd have to ask Jason. He's, afterwards, go to Jason. He's the one to explain all this to you. All I know is what the scripture says here is that somehow here was a man who set himself, who understood there were some things by the books and records that were meant to be. So he set himself, and he didn't see them happening, so he sets himself to seek the Lord. And he has been fasting 21 days, and now there comes this vision, this angelic vision from heaven that says the very first time you set yourself to seek me, you, you were heard in heaven but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, there was a battle in the heavenlies that you couldn't see happening. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And I'm going to stop right there to say that um, that whether you have a vision or not, you should know by this vision that when you set yourself to walk in those things that God said he would make powerful and you have been pressing your way and the enemy makes a, a last ditch desperate effort to survive or to, to keep things in place and you don't see them breaking through, don't give up. Keep pressing the day. I, I don't know how this battle takes place behind the scenes here. I don't know what all of that means. Here's what I do know. Heaven wins. Heaven wins. So stand with me tonight, would you? And just before we begin to worship, I want to just pray for you. What is withstanding you and there is a sense in you, not, not you, you're just hoping, but there's a sense in you that that should, have, that that should have moved some time ago. But you don't know why. You can't figure it out. You, whatever there is of the demonic battle behind what you see, I'm going to... Here's what I want to ask you to do as I pray tonight. I want to ask you to believe again. And I want to ask you to take these days that are before us as we set ourselves to fast uh, for, uh, for specific things in the realm of the spirit that have to do with the day, with our nation, with the mess that's around us, uh, with the focus of our congregation, with the project the Lord has before us, with the breaking through of a great harvest of people giving their lives to the Lord, with the visitation of the Spirit of God in miracle ministry, that He would come in presence and power in this. In the middle of all that, as we seek the face of the Lord corporately in these days, I want to ask you to take whatever this is tonight that you have that's specific to you, and, and as part of your focus, you focus on this every day. Lord, I've set my face to see your kingdom come. And so, Lord, I pray for the people of grace tonight. What everyone right now is holding in their heart where there needs to come breakthrough. Things that wouldn't budge, whatever those happen to be. Lord, we set ourselves tonight to seek you in these coming 21 days. May your kingdom come and your will be done. May the Michael of heaven 
come to intervene in the midst of the spiritual struggle that exists. May there be in these days testimonies of great breakthrough, of things that would never move before. But because we have set ourselves to seek your face, that somehow you have broken through in the middle of this day. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Tonight, Lord, we call heaven to earth. Let the power of heaven prevail. Let everything of hell that has withstood the people of God, let breakthrough come, I pray in Jesus' name. And let this, these, this season of fasting and these times, let there be great testimonies of victory. I pray, come to the people of grace and would all of you just say the name of Jesus. It is in his name, the name of Jesus.